what you got on tap. Boom. So, uh, Jerry, thank you for coming on the show. I do want to say, me. of course, I wanted to start with, and I start all of my podcasts with this question. What's your favorite superhero? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. Um, so the superhero, the greatest superhero. That's interesting. Um, first thing that came to my mind was uh, Moses. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So we we got to explore that then. And I know you have a long story, some awesome twists and turns. Let's start with that and how Moses has a play into kind of the oh, creation of your imagery. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> Uh, very clever. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it does it it, it it does loom large in a way because, and I know the I know the the segue you know into it from that. Yeah. Uh, the way it, you know my special uh, area of um, notability and yeah. prominence has to do with with uh, mental imagery mm-hmm. uh, and imagination. Imagination is the overarching subject uh so we're talking about a realm of existence that's real uh the realm that it exists in is called imaginal mm-hmm. uh it is the de- it is has no deep limitations it's called a no time zone and so imagination is an inner light a technique and a realm of existence that's real so one thing to to kind of grasp is that everything is real the imaginal is real, dreams are real, mental, the image experience is real, hallucinations are real, reverie is real, memory is real. Wherever you're existing at any given moment, that's where you are. So whatever uh, context you are living in at that very moment, a dream, a dream is real. And the point of it is that they're all equally real. So we don't make the material world the yardstick by which you measure reality. So we would say, for example, I dreamt last night, but in waking life, mm. I wouldn't say, as most people would do, almost the majority, I dreamt last night, but in real life. So this material world that we are inhabiting is a time, is a linear time, uh, three-dimensional space realm, a time-space realm for shorthand. Linear time, three-dimensional space, uh, which is a materially based realm. So it's material life. And, uh, but it doesn't represent that which is the uh, yardstick by which you measure everything else. That's a major mistake. And uh, so that leads you to certain implications and ideas uh, and beliefs that are really, uh, how should we say, antithetical Mm. to spiritual life. Because I am a, you know, a spiritually based teacher person and, so I come from the Western spiritual tradition. Uh, that's what I was taught. That's what I've given my life over to essentially uh, and have been doing that, I would say 60 years, Wow. give or take. So, yeah. you know, so this is where my pursuit has been. So the way of the imagination, the way, uh, and it's offshoots in what we call these short exercises, which we call mental imagery, the term that's used characteristically in everyday life is called visualizations, which I think is uh, not an apt term for it. But mental imagery, there are longer guided exercises in which we set up a theme for you to explore, which opens up a, uh, a portal into this, un- uh, this other level of reality uh, in which you can explore. Mm-hmm. And then there's a long inner journey called Waking Dream. Uh, in which you are uh, taking a dream experience and living it, living it, starting with the dream experience, go back into the dream and live a significant part of the dream or element. And you take that as a, as a step toward exploring the greater depths of the dream, uh, which can lead you to a cleansing of yourself and it can lead to a transcendent, transformative experience for yourself. So it's called the vertical axis. Okay. And the vertical axis is the axis of freedom. And uh, so as opposed to how we live here in time space, which is a 
more or less horizontal axis. Mm -hmm. the horizontal axis is cause and effect like this, yeah. but the vertical axis is um, not exactly this kind of, this causes that in material realm, in a material sense. I turn on the light switch and the light goes on. So we say, well, the, the light, the electricity caused the light to go on. And uh, so we don't, uh, uh, we go beyond, that's a purely material point of view. Totally, yeah. Yes, we take that as a beginning point to uh, explore. And I'll come back to Moses in a moment. So uh, a, uh, I went to my office one day uh, years ago and I parked my car in the space in front of the office mm -hmm. and I had a tight squeeze to get in. <clears throat> the woman in front of me saw how I was, you know, jiggling and engineering to get in, squeezing. And she came up to me and she said, uh, my, uh, I'm so sorry I didn't move my car. I saw how you were trying, you know, the effort you were putting in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I couldn't move my car. I was waiting for AAA to come because my battery is, my battery went dead. Yeah. And I said to her, uh, how is your inner battery? So I made a correlation and a relationship, an analogy, the law yeah. of analogic to see relationships and correlations, how things are connected to each other in this way without any conclusion being reached as you would in logic, that you would have a conclusionary statement which supplies an endpoint to something and for no further investigation and it closes the door. So I said to her, uh, what about, how's your inner battery? She says, funny you mentioned that. Uh, I was on my way to see the asthma doctor because mm. over the past week, I was having trouble breathing and my inner energy was, I, I was just losing energy and I yeah. was feeling very tired and so on. I said, as it would have it, I've done uh, major research in imagery uh, under the, and I've written two, two published papers on the treatment of mental imagery by my special way, which is through uh, a way called mental imagery. I didn't go on to explain it to her, but if you would wait here a moment, I will go, because I went into the office, I want to give you some information that may be useful to you. And I got her the two papers and I gave it to her. So in the course of that, that spontaneous meeting mm -hmm. that happened like that, uh, she got to a much more valuable information that was given to her that it just doesn't lead you on a course of material exploration where I go to the doctor, I can't breathe, he takes my pulmonary test, and he gives me medication, like a steroid-based medication, medication, something like that. I took her a step further and say, yes, there's a physical process mm -hmm. and there are physical means to approach it, but we also can go a little further and that we can go to understand it with more uh, implications to it and more recognition of what may be other factors that play into this matter that you're dealing with. Totally. Yes, go ahead. So, wow. Okay. There is a lot to unpack. Is this very similar to the mindset of your, if your internal reality is having some sort of chaos, some sort of um, discongruence, your external reality is mirroring and becoming the reflection. Yeah, It's a reflection of what's going on internally. Uh, by and large, in spiritual terms, everything that you're seeing and that you're uh, uh, experiencing and encountering in the everyday life is a reflection of what's going on in you. The conflicts that you're coming across are conflictual elements that are going on in you. And there is a war going on in us constantly uh, in a conflictual way. Uh, we call that uh, uh, the uh, war that goes on in us between that part of us that is um, been uh, uh, created very early in life, soon after birth, in which there are beliefs that have mm. insinuated themselves in our system and they come in the form of what in the ancient world was called um, demonic influences. That, that is, okay. So that you were uh, infested with these uh, particular entities. Today, as we look at it in a slightly different way uh, to, uh, to say that there is a part of us that is, thinks, feels, and behaves in a way 
that's inimical to our health. Yes. And the uh, and that we call is divided into two camps, a uh, a camp of threateners and intimidators, uh, that we call false selves. I term them inner terrorists, that want to threaten and intimidate us to blame and complain, stand up for your rights, yes, create a revolution and so on. And then there's a, a, a camp that we call the seducers and the flatterers, which want to be different to curry your favor and also want to please and appease and do what the authorities tell you because they know more about you than you could possibly know about yourself. So these, these two camps are at war with each other in us. Totally. And they find their, their, uh, uh, their expression outside in the world around us. The situations that come to us are often, uh, in, particularly in social conflict, are expressions of how we want the external world mm -hmm. to fix it for us. And we want them to take over the responsibility for us and give us what we need. And what we need is the major mistake in life, which is to get to a place of pleasure and comfort, to a state of non-disturbance, uh, to, uh, 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 and to avoid pain. So the major false belief that's been insinuated in us from early on is that the purpose of living, a purpose of living, yeah. to get to uh, a state of comfort and pleasure, non-disturbance, all with the aim of avoiding pain. And the more you work your life around that, the more pain you incur. And the more pain you incur, the more you wear away your physiological, biological system to have to deal with the pain that you're experiencing and the misery and so on. So, so you know, Buddha said that the, the lot of human suffer, the lot of human existence is suffering. Mm. Here's where we're talking about what's the source of this suffering, a source of this suffering, and that the uh, and our job is to clean this out and to open up uh, us to other possibilities that we can look at yeah. to uh, resolve these difficult situations. And in my work, I've developed a system of, a new system of medicine in which takes us to levels beyond problem solving, which most systems of therapeutics are involved in, mm -hmm. solving a problem and leaving it at that. And then we use that as a jumping off point yeah. to find out what the social disturbances are, what the social areas of living are and that have birthed the problems. So it's now a vertical, so we're getting in a sort of a vertical direction. The problems are here, time, space. What's birthed them? Social yeah. errors of living, which we can see is, is a kind of above birthing downward. What's birthed the social errors? What's birthed the social errors are spiritual errors. Yes. The spiritual errors that are not followed in the, uh, in the laws that are the uh, overarching direction of how we need to live life when they're lived in error will birth the social errors which will birth the time space the 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 physical emotional mental social errors uh the, the problems yeah of our everyday life okay so, so yes go ahead so the with uh internal reality mirroring external reality which was yeah. kind of what we just went over with um I've had a theory, something that I often uh, ponder, which is heaven and hell is the creation of what you're experiencing now. And what you were just going into seemed very similar to that mindset, which is like you create hell around you or you create heaven around you. That's correct. And I agree with that. Yeah. So this world, there, there, are two division, there, there are two divisions in this world. There's a... Uh, the world that was created that was heavenly, uh, this is now the spiritual point from mm -hmm. Western tradition. Uh, there was a spiritual world that was created that's heavenly here on earth, which is imbued, embodied in the six days of creation at the beginning of Genesis. Mm -hmm. So there was an endemic existence that was created here, a beautiful existence in the six days, uh, and then a seventh day of rest. And in that six days, everything was perfect, and nothing needed to be improved. But the material world came along and said, in its error-filled way, which we call the man-made world, which was grafted on to this Edenic world, 
to show that it was dominant and that it was going to be the authority that would take you afield from and apart from this recognition that you are born here into a world that's already perfect. Mm. There's nothing that needs to be improved. So, of course, the mistake that had been made, spiritually speaking, was that it, uh, we were led to believe that we we're missing something. Yes. And that's the story of Eve and Adam in the garden where the serpent comes as a test to see how morally perfected this couple has been living in their Edenic world. Mm. And the serpent comes to say to uh, uh, Adam's asleep in the corner and comes to Eve and says, you know, you can become as God. Look over there. And, and she looks and he says, you see that tree? She sees it. Look, see, and there's a tree of um, goodies. Yeah. Where you can, and where there is so much there that you can take from, and suddenly it dawns on her, I'm missing something, because I was told originally by the source that I have everything, because in Eden everything exists. There's no death, no disease, yeah. there's endless happiness and bliss. So everything is there that you could possibly need, but then something's introduced, uh, a what we call the seed source of all the troubles in the world from a mental point of view, of all the troubles, yeah. all the maladies, which is called doubt. And doubt has the meaning of two. And so he's, the, the serpent says, there's a second tree. There's a tree over there, another tree. And mm -hmm. the, the couple was told, you know, there's a, there is a second tree. Don't eat of it, lest you die. So what's been introduced is there's a death tree. Mm. So there's a life tree, a tree of life, and there's a tree of death. And the serpent says, ah, I don't pay attention to that. You can really, you know, you, you can become as God if you eat from that tree. Yeah. But don't eat from it unless you die, was told. But the, I, I, I look, I see, I take. Because mm. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm seduced by it. I see all the goodies. And now I've eaten from the death tree, which is the tree of duality of two yes and that's the basis of all the spiritual traditions in the world that the dual world is the world of conflict and suffering and splitting apart and divisiveness and conflicts and war and all the things that come out of that and etc and people uh, strife social strife per, you know pitting brother against brother mm -hmm. all over the world sister against sister all of that so it comes from from all of that mistake Totally. Totally. And so we're, we're having to deal with this hellish world that we have taken part of and chosen to, to live by and so on. Now, I think one of the interesting things is with that story, the snake a lot of times I've read is paralleled with Kundalini or the awakening. Um, and when you look at it and the, the um, I forget the book right now, but they talk about the snake being almost a, uh, in many other cultures, it was almost the mother, like, like showing what was going on um, and really trying to show the truth, which would create the dualistic nature. What do you think about that? And the way that Kundalini, because theoretically upon activation through DMT and the pineal gland creates that imagery similar to the imagery that you could create, that would help to either align you or misalign you, depending on the way that you right. uh, utilize it. Uh, the, the serpent or the snake is a dual base, is a, a complex symbol. It represents on the one hand, the creative source, like Kundalini energy, mm -hmm. on the other it represents a destructive source. So it, it, it functions in both ways. And uh, so it's a question of how you approach it and how it's utilized mm. as it lives itself through you, this energy, which way you're going to go. So in the, in the Western tradition, it gets uh, translated into a statement that's extremely powerful in, uh, in uh, the Western wisdom tradition, where in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, God says to the people, I set before you at every moment a duality. I set before you at every moment life and death, mm -hmm good and evil, blessings and curses. The next statement is essentially paraphrasing, I set before you life and death, choose, and I recommend that you choose life so you and your descendants may live. 
And so he's saying, look, there's a life path and there's a death path. You can go one way or the other. And uh, most people have been uh, conditioned by this miseducation that's come down through yeah. uh, eons of training and conditioning and miseducation to do what Eve did, which was to choose the death path. Because mm -hmm. by eating from the sec from the tree of death, it's consigned everybody to die. Ha! Huh. But there's also, it says, there's a life path. I set before you one or the other. So you can choose one or the other. If you choose life, you'll live and your descendants will live. Which to me was a, a powerful statement that really set me on this course of what my life work has been devoted to, which has been to teach the life path. How do you live a life path? Yeah. Everybody has been taught how to live a death path. And the working, the ongoing, uh, to me, false belief is death is inevitable. Of course it's inevitable because you're eating from the death tree. You have to die. Ah, but I set before you a choice. So now you can choose a life path to eat from the tree of life, if you will, to live a complete, to live a life-bearing way. Yeah. So the serpent can show you the way toward life or can show you the way towards death. Uh, it depends on which way you seek that you choose it because we've been born with free will and choice. So it hasn't, our freedom hasn't been imposed upon by coming a living human being to have to do one way or the other. I set before you a choice so you can go one way or the other as you see fit. There is no comprehensive um, uh, uh, way that, uh, that up to my work Mm -hmm. that has been taught to anybody in any tradition on how to choose a life path moment to moment to moment. So the, uh, so the, the way that I uh, formulate my teaching is to teach you at every moment how to be aware uh, mentally, emotionally, and behaviorally of whether you are choosing a life path or a death path, that you can become aware of yeah. it at every moment in a socially based life experience where you're living with others in a socially shared world and what you do in relation to that socially shared world where you're encountering all the time um, uh, stim stimuli coming from this encounter in which you have to choose one way or the other. So we, we, don't, we don't escape from a socially sh uh, uh, shared world. We live it. We have to live in communion with each other mm -hmm. in uh, collaboration or conflict. And so, and, and this so, yeah. is... Yeah, and this is the content that you're writing right now with. We are not meant to die, correct? Right, right. because it's a, it bases itself on the physiological, biological, uh, uh, spiritually based understanding of how we choose a life path, and if you continue to choose a life mm -hmm. path, and that we're born I, that we're born with a trace memory that we're here to live forever. And I point out in the book how that how that gets expressed in us biologically and physiologically and how it becomes a trace memory that comes with us out of the womb and how that, and, uh, and I think I made a, a nice case for that. Uh, yeah. There are beings who never died in the Western tradition. Uh, so we take, we take the tradition as not being, there's no such thing as metaphor. It's a concrete reality. There are beings who, uh, we yeah. never died within the historical unfoldment. There are beings that never died, uh, like the prophet Elijah, for mm -hmm. example, Enoch, the son of Seth, who yeah. was the son of Adam and Eve, who never died, and so on. So there are beings, and there are beings who have come back from the dead, and there are at least eight accounts of beings who have returned from the dead to life, and that's the antechamber to, to that ongoing life, yeah. the return of the dead souls to life, and so on and how biology has come to see that you can take the DNA from bones, from ancient fossils, and recreate new life Yeah. Uh, out of the DNA, because the DNA never dies in the bones. Mm. And that is why, that's why uh, uh, the, uh, the bones never uh, deteriorate. So, so they, and they found by finding these uh, ancient dinosaur bones and other animals, woolly mammoth they found, and when they explore their bone material, they see the DNA is alive. And out of the DNA, you can generate a brand new being uh, out of it. And they've done it with sheep, Dolly the sheep, who's been uh, recreated yeah. from a 
dead sheep and so on. Of course, the bones contain the life force. And that brings us, so that, um, in a way, takes a circle back to, Mo to Moses. Yeah. Uh, because the uh, um, one thing, uh, Moses has never been discovered where his tomb is. Mm. Uh, but uh, he uh, was said at the, uh, at supposedly the end of his story that he wrote, which are the first five books of Moses, it's called. And in that, uh, at the end, he's kissed by God. And that's it. And it never says that he actually ever has an end to his life. Mm. And that he's buried somewhere. Be that as it may, what he represents is this tradition called the prophetic tradition, uh, which uh, is a um, long-standing tradition, I would say, of 3,500 years at least. And what it represents is that <clears throat> there is a uh, practice of reestablishing this prophetic tradition in which you can enter into the realm of no time, the, world, the realm of imagination, in which you can reach the heights of transcendence and, mm -hmm. and transformation, uh, and you can go to the depths of self to find the deepest uh, knowing of yourself. So you can come to know yourself through this ascent or descent, and at the same time, gather information about yourself so that you can come to know yourself in a uh, in a, uh, a very deep uh, recognition of who you are, what you are, what your purpose is here, and so on. So, so with, yes. with that, that no time, the it it seems like a three point connection to forty, which is three D in time in physics, uh, astral the astral plane, and forty. Yeah, four D. Yeah. yeah. Um, the astral plane and kind of almost the spiritual transcendence that people uh, with um, any type of like so, uh, psychedelic holotropic breathing, that mm -hmm. style of thing. Is that the, the realm, the, the almost imagination based um, conscious representation of what is going on with that? Yes. I've done that on my own. I've gone through holotropic breathing ex experience. I've gone through uh, ethnogenic experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I've known a, a deep uh, uh, recognition that's come with that because all of it takes you out of your, uh, out of your habitual, reflexive, mm -hmm. habitual time space uh, um, experience of stimulus response. Mm -hmm. of the usual stimulus response. Uh, and you saw it and you leave, you leave this uh, particular existence to enter into another level of existence, which is real. And things happen to you there, which can be uh, uh, revelatory. And the prophetic realm is a revelatory realm, uh, uh, as an example, as these, uh, as these other processes that you mentioned can be revelatory. Yeah, and you experience something different and something new, something non habitual about yourself, that opens uh, doors for you, so to speak, about what life is about and what your purpose is for being here and so on, and uh, and so uh, there were all these possibilities that exist to take you out of time space, mm -hmm. which is necessary because you need to extract yourself from the death world. This world, yeah. the man-made world, is the death tree world. It's the it's the world of the of um, that the second tree, mm -hmm. and the man-made world is a world that's that's been that's formulated here and it's supposed to be here to allow you the opportunity to extract yourself from it to reach those heights, as it says in the Western tradition, to walk on the waters of the heights with spirit. Yeah. So we we are. Uh, I believe we're destined to do it. I believe that it's a destiny of the human, of our human existence to come to it. Uh, I think the chaotic situation that's existing now uh, is, uh, is uh, wonderfully planned and purposeful for us because we have to go through a black hole 
yes. of, of disorganization and decomposition to come out on the other side of self-organization, greater complexity, which is the, uh, the way of life. Life is a greater organization. You come, the, the, death, the death experience is a disorganization. And so we can, uh, if, the, if it exists on one side, a disorganization, it, it occurs that you can't be talking about that unless you understood there is a self-organization that can follow. So, so out, of, out of the chaos comes greater growth. With, yeah. and this is, uh, with something like a near-death experience, is I that a, I call it a near life experience. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And that's what I want to ask you about because this seems a lot like when that happens, you're pulling that life back. Like you, you then do choose life. You're choosing life. So you're going into that experience and, uh, and commonly seeing what's there for you. Most of the people see a light and they feel relieved of all the burdens of life seem to be lifted. Mm hmm. Uh, it follows the uh, the uh, what Buddha said, which he spoke for all the traditions that the source of all suffering is attachment. Mm. And uh, and I go into depths in my work to understand what attachment is. I'm attached to my beliefs, my false beliefs, my preconceptions, my story making. I'm attached to all of that. I'm attached to my distressing emotions, which are wearing away my physiology. Uh, I'm attached to my uh, addictive behaviors and so i keep i'm attached to all of that and my fantasies etc and when we enter into the uh, these other levels like this experience of seeing a, a a way towards light yeah people people feel and i've had that experience myself people feel relieved of all burdens that nothing matters that, that there's nothing here that really is I'm, I'm detached. Yeah. Become suddenly detached from everything. And I feel a sense of joy and of uh, contentment and happiness and peace. And, uh, and then, uh, so they're being received by the light. And uh, so they understand for a moment what it is to become a spiritual being of light, mm -hmm. which is essentially what, what happens to us as we move toward the, as we move on in the life path. As you move on the life path, your awareness your awareness opens up enormously, and you become a vehicle of light. And uh, so, in that regard, even then, people yeah. have the choice. They're given the choice to go or to come back. I made the choice to come back with the family, with children, and wife, and so on. I wanted to come back and be with, and I came back. Yeah. So, but the but I saw what's there I understood about the the uh, the being of light what it is to become a being of light temper you know for a moment yeah that's been a great a great uh, influence on my work and so you can become a being of light as you move along the life path you're getting rid of all you're getting rid of the darkness that is suffusing us you know the material that, items the, yes and the so we're getting rid of the uh, those burdens that we have taken on unnecessarily and so we are uh, wearing our yoke easily and relieving yeah. ourselves of unnecessary burdens and living in a what it, i think it means to be human in the human world yeah a, a developed human oh really uh, yeah. the uh, consider it, make a contribution, be harmless, be divinely inspired, to uh, to be gratuitous in the in the extolling sense of it, to give yourself of yourself freely without needing to get back to you. So you're generous and genial, and uh, so you're happy to to render to others and to give to others without a need to re for a return. Yeah, and uh, to be humane. To be humane, yeah, and uh, so even this thing that's happening at the border with the uh, kids being, you know, yeah. kidnapped from their parents, uh, which I feel is a murder. Mm -hmm. Its way to separate the two, where they may never meet again, we don't know, but yeah. to be taken away at one years of age or you know two years of age and all of that, and to suddenly go through that shocking experience of no parents anymore, and um, and the uh, the 
the urge of humanity that's come to protect these kids uh, against the uh, inhumane yeah. policy, you know, to separate, which had uh, a great prof a profound meaning, a profound influence, impact, because I grew up during the Holocaust. Okay, yeah. In, yep. in 1940s, you know, in 40, 41, 42, 43. And, uh, of course, that's what was being done. The, the parents were being separated from their children in the camps, never yeah. to see them again and so on. So it was quite reminiscent of that, you know. Uh, so it bore the, of the same impulse mm -hmm. in humanity and so on. So uh, the, uh, in, in developing my work, of course, I wrote a book called Healing Visualizations. Yes. Which has been out since 1989. Uh, I think it's uh, it's going into 22nd printing, maybe. I know it's the 21 printings. Yeah. Or That's awesome. And it's published in, uh, uh, I think, in 21 languages in 24 countries. It's been published and pirated. And uh, so it's made a mark. And it has to do with the short, the short imageries that you can use to um, create a cure. Yes. For, uh, for problems, to reverse them, to reverse problems um, immediately by doing yeah. that. Now, is it moving into the quantum realm? Um, because a lot of, I do a lot of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza's work, um, but the meditations around um, quantum uh, visualization and really being able to feel the kind of energy fields that uh, circumnavigate you. Yes. No, we can do, yeah, we do, we can do, imagine we can just enter into them. And we do do that. Uh, I did want to make a point, uh, uh, because I've been such a champion for the imaginal experience, Yeah. that imagination and meditation are not the same. Okay. Uh, so uh, meditation is a, has its own characteristics as a, uh, as a state of consciousness. Uh, imagination has its own peculiar characteristics as a state of consciousness. And that's been detailed in a... Uh, large study that I participated in, in 1982, that was published in the Journal of uh, Imagination, Personality, and Cognition awesome. out of Yale University at that time. It's now transferred, I think, up to Amherst or the University of Massachusetts. And uh, it was, uh, the major researcher was Dan Brown, who was a hypnotherapist and a Buddhist meditator. Awesome. And I contributed 80 studies of people going through this imaginal long inner journey and uh, he found that um, there were distinct differences because he was really an honest researcher he didn't have a bone to pick not a pre prejudice and he found that the paper had to deal with mindfulness meditation uh, self-hypnosis mm -hmm. and waking dream my work and he found that waking dream was a distinct state of consciousness separate from the other two and each had its own distinct characteristics. So uh, uh, the, I think that if you're doing imagery, if you're doing what you're calling visualizations, yes, that's a different state of being than in a meditative state. Okay. You see, so uh, to me, uh, I feel it's necessary to be precise uh, and keep things separate like that so you can make distinctions, not to... Um, sort of be lied one into the other and mix them all together and so on. And uh, it unifies the ability to really strengthen the benefits from the it. The benefits well. of it. And it's more scientifically sound. Okay. So um, the, to keep it in its direct path, pure path without contamination mm -hmm. or pollution and so on. So, so, I, it's, uh, so it has a value if you're doing these um, practices with the quantum way to go into yeah. Uh, these fields of energy that are around you. Interestingly, in the um, spiritual tradition of the West, uh, energy is on the third plane. So you have uh, spirit, mm -hmm. which is that uh, kind of indefinable isness, that vast, uh, how shall I call it? Without that, without being, it's a yeah. yes. And then the next level is force. The next level that it that comes down yeah. to a birth to birth to birth situation, not this horizontal birth to effect, but birth to birth to birth, 
to manifestation in the physical time space world. And what comes down uh, is uh, the seven, what I call seven divine forces will, love, faith, hope, intuition, imagination, and light. Seven divine forces, awesome. which then on the next level show energy manifestations that surround us, mm -hmm. auras that surround us, emanations that come from us, because what comes from us is not an aura, it's yeah. an emanation. But the auras are auric fields that are around us. Those are energy fields that now there are gadgets that are capable of measuring them. Yeah. And then, so you have spirit, force, energy, matter. And then what's birth from these vibrational forces that are interdigitating with each other are mater is material life. And so we're comprised of, uh, in a, in a, as a material being, we are comprised of vibratory rates and, you know, that are, and, yeah. and energetic movements that are going through us. Awesome. So uh, the the uh, so we're not an, and this work that I do is not an energy medicine. So uh, I call my work the science and art of becoming a whole human being. Awesome. So uh, you know so what we're doing is we're shifting from the current that's been with us for three or four hundred years, the science of disease model. So you're just a case. You know you're yeah. a liver. You know. Yep, and you're yep. <laughs> changing that into uh, seeing the whole human being as he as it, as the human being expresses him or herself at each moment. Awesome. At each so, moment we express ourselves in five dimensions of expression: physical, emotional, mental, social, and spiritual. Five dimensions all at one time. Behaving in three dimensions of um, experience: mental, emotional, head, brain, heart. Mm -hmm and and um, behavioral uh, yeah. the, the uh, arms and legs so we, we we are expressing ourselves in these what these five dimensions dimensions of experience show us awesome i did want to ask so with the the rich map of information and the connections that you've seen what was some skill uh whether that's learning to learn better pattern recognition or something that allowed you to not only connect the dots, but really create this solid map and get to where you are today. In other words, what, what happened to me? Um, yeah. Either what happened or. Well, I could tell you, I could tell you in a sense what, what I've gone through in a, in a shorthand way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I met my teacher in 1974 uh, on a trip to Jerusalem where I was invited to come to a, uh, a medical school hospital setting in Jerusalem mm -hmm. to teach uh, 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 psychiatry and law. I founded a journal with a friend of mine who was an attorney. <clears throat> I founded a journal called the Journal of Psychiatry and Law in 1973, which still exists. Yeah. And, uh, and I was invited by the head of the psychiatry department there to come and teach. So uh, I went over there uh, with my ex-wife, and uh, so that was my first journey. And that was an important journey to this, you know, in terms of getting to do this. Well, through a course of circumstances, I was introduced to the woman who became my teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, so in that, in the first five minutes of our meeting, I had an illuminative experience. And with that, I went through a major detachment phase, as Buddha described. He, he says, the source of all suffering is attachment. The work that I have developed are called the laws of detachment, which helps you to extricate yourself from the dual world of conflict and time-space disturbances and so on. So I went through a major um, detached phase in that experience. In that first five minutes of meeting, uh, I gave up my attachments to being called a doctor, a psychoanalyst, a psychiatrist, uh, the, the medical model, all of that disappeared. And I became a being of light, another light experience. Yeah. And th so this identification as Jerry disappeared altogether. It was just a flash of light. I don't know how long that took for me to come back here to uh, with a consciousness of being in this time space world from that 
but I knew that by coming back from that, that there was something here that I had to follow. That something was there between this woman and myself that was of truth. And everything else disappeared. I gave it all up yeah. in that moment. And that was the beginning of my search into this subject matter of imagination, mental imagery, uh, the, the ancient system, the ancient model of medicine, uh, and developing a, uh, uh, a consolidation of all of this ancient study and my investigations of current yeah. uh, things going on that, that attended to that, that were in the same direction. So I do, and all of that led to all of this. Awesome. So I've spent every day of my life since that moment in May 1974 doing nothing but investigating on my in my pursuit of this work. I've never yeah. gone a day without pursuing this work in some manner, shape, or form. 44 years of endless investigation. I'm still learning. Yeah. Yes, that's there's always more to learn. That is so awesome. That's, me, that's been what... The the short the capsule summary of all of that about how I got here. So I've come across uh, people who I could regard as teachers, mm -hmm. although I didn't have direct contact as I had with my teacher. But people whose work I came across, who were in the same direction, but from different vantage points. Um, Valentin Tomberg, the anonymous author of Meditations on a Tarot, mm -hmm. to Christian Hermeticism. Uh, Dr. Robert Rondell Gibson, uh, The Science of Man, and his work, uh, which is extremely influential, and other, other people, um, uh, Frederick Weinreb, uh, a European uh, a contributor called Roots of the Bible, um, Paul Watzlawick, Henry Corbin, who was a, uh, professor, a French professor who was an expert in Sufism, and learned oh, that, awesome. about that. And about the great imaginal, there's uh, the great um, uh, imagination uh, uh, savant in the Arabic world named Ibn Arabi, mm. and his work on creative imagination in the Sufism of Ibn, of Ibn Arabi, monumental work, and so on. So all of this I yeah. just got in touch with, and uh, met a boss, a Swiss, uh, a Swiss former Swiss analyst. He gave that up to, yeah, to apply himself in this way of work and treatment. Um, so, so there's so many. So the number of people played a, a big role here. That is awesome. So when is the new book uh, supposed to come out, and when can I have people looking for it? <laughs> well, that's uh, I'm hoping. Uh, it's uh, we're looking for it to come out later this year. Awesome. Uh, it's now getting into August. Yeah. So uh, we're looking forward for it to be on tap perhaps in November, December, like that, with fingers crossed. Awesome. And, um, so when it comes, I'll certainly let you know. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you'll have the good offices and yourself to uh, have another, we have another uh, interview. Oh, yeah. About of the work itself, you know, and be glad to share what the all the stuff in that yeah otherwise i will point everybody else towards the many other books that you've written the Kabbalah. In, in my website dr jerry epstein.org awesome uh, d-r-j-e-r-r-y epstein e-p-s-t-e-i-n.org no dot after doctor just dr and uh i think i have a ton of material on there many 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 imagery exercises dream reading face reading all of the, all of these things that I learned uh, in my journey, while de while dealing with the imagery, the dream is an inner imagery experience. The face is an outer imagery. It was a diagnostic, a major diagnostic way in Western medicine until the Renaissance, middle of the Renaissance, and so on, which is a major diagnostic force that's still in vogue in the French medical school system. It's taught. Awesome. So, so much, I have so much. So I, much. I've rendered so much on, <laughs> that site. all free. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. I'm glad, yeah, because it's good too. I'm glad to, to share it, you know, so that's what it's here for. Well, it's phenomenal it's, uh, work. The tradition says uh, what you learn, you must teach. Yes, 100%. That's it, yeah.
Well, thank you so, so very, much. Thanks. It was very nice meeting you. Uh, and I hope to meet you again. Oh, yeah. Yes, of course. It's been a pleasure. To thank you. Thank you so much.